plus a bit, a bit shorter, so... Um, we'll, we've seen two cases and the conclusion is somewhat different with respect to CO2 emissions. In the first case with the rope axis, we saw that uh, they, were, they had a hard time competing with uh, the trucks. Um, in the second case, where we looked at slightly s bigger vessels and specialized cargo vessels, it looked a bit better from the shipping point of view. And why do you think it, could, it is hard for the Ropax ferries to, to compete? How are the Ropax ferries different to the bigger, more specialized cargo vessels? with respect to energy consumption per transport unit. Any idea why they are having a hard time competing? I don't know if you use some of these Ropax ferries. Norwegians typically take them to Denmark or Germany, but they are present in many parts of the world. They look more like cruise liners. And they, are, they have a higher speed that's the main explanatory factor. They are operating at quite high speeds. They're designed for 22 knots or something like that. And, uh, uh, and they quite often they uh, operate at that speed as well. OK, the last case is uh, a calculation that I've done based on data from an operator, which I'm not supposed to mention the name of. So I won't do that, but uh, it's an operator that operates uh, pallet vessels between northern Russia, Murmansk, down the Norwegian coast and down to Europe. Um, this is an operation which takes uh, three weeks to go all the way around. And they have a vast number of ports that they call at. Um, they call it slightly different ports on each round trip, but um, on average, some 25, or, or not on average, but uh, up, up until 25 ports per round trip. These are modern vessels, um, so they're not old ones, but they are quite small, two and a half thousand tons. They can mainly carry pallets uh, under deck, but also a few uh, containers on deck. Most of the front haul cargo is frozen fish. It's uh, second to the oil and gas. This is the most important export article from Norway. Uh, on the back haul, they take any kind of suitable palletized cargo. This is not the vessel in question, so I've just used a different, uh, uh, this is a slightly older uh, one. Now, <laughs> Here is some characteristics of a typical round trip. They will have a number of port calls, slightly less on the northbound bit. Um, and they produce a lot of transport work on each round trip. Um, the average load factor on the southbound leg is uh, some 65%, meaning that they are able to fill the vessel on the average 65%. Slightly worse on the northbound because they have slightly less cargo available there. And this could be illustrated further by two graphs. This is the southbound one. So the T's here are the ports or terminals. T1 is Murmansk up in, in Russia. So they start in Russia, go down the Norwegian, nor, northern part of the Norwegian coast. And this part here is in Ålesen, our neighbor town to the south where a lot of the cargo is transferred into containers for intercontinental uh, shipping, uh, for instance, to South uh, America. So then the pallet vessel loses a lot of its cargo, but then it picks up some more cargo south of, of Olesund before it leaves the Norwegian coast and goes to either to the UK or down to, to uh, Belgium or the Netherlands. And you can see that uh, it's only a small part of the trip that they actually fill the vessel. So in a situation like this, when they have a lot of port calls, it's very hard to achieve a high load factor. So 66% is actually quite good. On the northbound, you have to read it the other way around. They start down in Europe, either on the UK side or the mainland, and then uh, 
uh, pick up cargo along the Norwegian coast and end up in Murmansk in, in uh, Russia. Here again, they only able to fill the vessel almost towards the end of the, uh, the trip, not so much in the beginning. And this means that the load factor is less than half of the capacity. Now, we can, uh, I've got uh, data for the engine reports and so on, so I know what kind of uh, bunker or fuel they, they use and how much. And this is something called intermediate fuel oil. And then they have uh, some auxiliary engines which are used for power production, which use uh, marine diesel oil. Now, if we calculate, um, well, I think I'll uh, we'll just focus on the average here. The average CO2 emissions here is uh, uh, 61 grams per ton kilometer. Now, to compare this, I've taken all the um, shipments over a full year serviced by one of these vessels and say that let's say that we have a hypothetical trucking operation that we leave all this cargo to a truck company instead of using the vessels and then I try to calculate what will this mean uh, in terms of emissions so um, there were uh, we need to allocate some 27 trucks and trailers to each consignment, each uh, shipment. Uh, that's the maximum then. And uh, we assume no cargo consolidation on the front hull, meaning that they are only serving this particular market and not taking any other cargo. Um, and then in this case, the roads are more winding and they have to go around uh, Denmark, uh, if they go all the way to Europe and so on. So in, on average, the road is 33% longer than the sea in this case, in the South Pond one. Now, um, the uh, load factors for the trucks are, are higher. It's easier to fill a number of trucks than to fill the big vessels. And then, um, depending on how you assume the trucks to pick up return cargo on their way back home, uh, these figures turn out to be quite different for the trucks. If we assume that they are not able to pick up any return cargo, then the emission um, uh, based on, on the road distance is 98.6 uh, uh, grams. If they, we assume 50% return cargo, this drops to 65.7 grams and then if you assume that they have just as much cargo on the return trip as they have on the front hull then the figure is slightly less than 50 grams per ton kilometer if you look at this graphically you have the liner vessel which we have the actual figures for down here it was uh, the average it was 66 uh, grams co2 per ton kilometer and then you have different alternatives. If we leave out these top, which are from the different articles, uh, you can look at the different tra truck trailer calculations here. The best figure for the trailer is, of course, if they have 100% return cargo, then uh, they would be, oh, sorry, uh, something that uh, doesn't fit with these. But you, you will see that the, in these cases, with 100% return cargo, the, the truck trailer is more or less on par with the vessel. And, um, but if the truck has more empty return trips, they will not be able to compete. Once again, picking up this figure, let's see if it fits now. Uh, we have seen that the general cargo vessel, which this would be, uh, has a significantly higher uh, figure than the one presented by the IMO in this policy paper. They claim that general cargo vessels are more or less a maximum of, well, some 25 grams. Whereas in this data set, I've calculated 66 grams per ton kilometer. The trucks are also ex exaggerated a little bit uh, here, so they are slightly more efficient. Now, the first figures that I've shown was on a part on, on only one round trip. This is the all year round 
load factors, and you can see that the seasonal variations are quite big. The solid line here is the front hole, the southbound leg, which is generally higher than the northbound. But you can see from round trip one, uh, two, which is in January, and number three and so on, you can see that uh, there is quite a bit of, diff uh, of variation. In one case, it's more than 100%, and this is either uh, some error in the data, or they have loaded more than they should on the vessel. So we shouldn't investigate too much. On the return trip, they're not able to collect that much cargo. Uh, they also had a return trip uh, around Easter, where they dropped a lot of ports. So if you calculate the CO2 emissions then for each round trip, you'll see that it varies very much um, according to uh, the achieved number of tons of cargo that you can have. So if you just randomly pick one round trip from a vessel, you can see that you can get very different answers. And um, this, uh, this is uh, one of the lessons from this uh, particular study, that uh, the variations are very big. If you uh, look at it graphically, you will see that the truck uh, performance here is dependent on the return cargo, 50% return cargo, 80% return cargo figures. And uh, you can s if you calculate it by the road distance rather than the sea distance, it's uh, slightly lower because they have a distance disadvantage. Um, compared to the, the vessel, uh, it's only when the truck is more or less full on the return trip that it's competitive. If we calculate the five strongest front haul, the five best trips from a shipping point of view, you will have an average emis emission of some 50 grams. Uh, if you look at the five worst backhaul trips, on average, you will have an emission of 318 grams. So this goes to show how different it is in weak markets and uh, in strong markets. The trucking alternative has a ratio between 63 and 124 grams. Uh, and this means that the vessel beats trucks with 80% return cargo when the market is good. But uh, with uh, uh, the, the ship, uh, the, the truck actually beats the ship when the market is weak, even if it doesn't have any return cargo. So if you just go out and pick one particular round trip from a vessel, you can make any kind of conclusions uh, based on, on this, depending on whether you pick a weak market situation or a strong market situation. So, trying to sum up these three cases then. It illustrates that short sea shipping may deserve the green label when it comes to CO2. In most cases, it will be the mode with lowest CO2 emissions per ton kilometer. Um, the short sea operation uh, is with modern uh, vessels here, but we have not in this case focused on sulfur and NOx and particle emissions, and they would normally be significantly higher for the marine operation. Um, compared to the official figures of the IMO, though, um, the vessels in this study has a significantly higher emission level, um, and the trucking operation is in the lower end or lower than the figures presented by the IMO. But there are a number of moderating factors. Um, if we looked at impacts rather than emissions, the consequences of the emissions, then there is uh, good reason to, uh, uh, to um, guess that uh, these impacts would be smaller for ships than for road transport. Um, both because, uh, with respect to CO2 emissions, there are some studies that, uh, that show that uh, CO2 emissions at sea would have a smaller um, impact. And then sulfur and NOx emissions would have smaller impacts when they are emitted far from where people live. Uh, and, and that's typical for quite a bit of the shipping activities. 
But there may also be other reasons for promoting short sea shipping versus road transport, apart from the environmental perspective, and avoiding traffic accidents and noise, and eroding, uh, uh, avoiding congestion on the road networks is another one. To end, uh, end this uh, lecture, let's just uh, look at uh, uh, the future a little bit. Uh, there are several ways to reduce the environmental footprint. Uh, we have mentioned already that slow steaming is a simple, efficient and feasible thing. It's happening a lot at the moment, but uh, the question is what will happen when markets are getting better, whether they will then run at full steam again. LNG gas uh, is uh, much better than diesel oil with, uh, with respect to emissions. The ferries crossing the fjord here is LNG propelled, for instance, and they have very much lower uh, emissions than diesel or heavy fuel oil vessels. And then you have a lot of other uh, things that you could do also to make this better. Then we have this new Annex 6 Marpol um, actions coming. This is uh, a planned LNG coastal vessel which will I think be delivered this year or next year for a coastal operation in Norway. Maybe this is the future on the road transport. Poor horse. I thought actually it was pulling the car but it's a car for training racehorses I discovered afterwards. <laughs> and this is uh, Sustainable shipping, maybe. Or maybe we need to go back to wind power. This is a modern version of the, that vessel. Um, this has actually been tried. Do any of the Germans know the Beluga shipping? Yeah. They went bankrupt last year, fortunately. But uh, they were part of this trial with the, the sky sails uh, thing, with the kite. And they claimed that uh, this could save. 15, 20, maybe 30 percent of fuel. Yeah, I think we'll drop this to too much detail here. Uh, in the IMO report that we've been referring to, these are some prospects of uh, lower emissions uh, following these uh, technology uh, possibilities and also um, uh, market regulations. This is meant to illustrate, the fact the blue line here illustrates that quite a lot of these uh, things that you can do with uh, reducing fuel consumption, for instance, would actually be uh, at zero costs or lower. They would actually be um, self-financing ones. Uh, the latest uh, regulations from the IMO is uh, related to CO2 emissions, uh, so-called Chapter 4 amendments to Annex 6, uh, which was uh, adopted a couple of years ago. And they uh, have start, uh, developed this ship energy efficient uh, uh, management plan and uh, gradually we will see also new technical standards with respect to, to energy efficiency, uh, ending up with uh, some effects on CO2 emissions as well. Um, these are the different instruments that are used in this uh, new amendments to the Marple Convention and uh, um, it's partly about new uh, design indexes for new vessels uh, and partly about management plans and, uh, and uh, it has just started to, to take effect. These are the future uh, uh, effects of, uh, of uh, this new design index uh, and uh, uh, the reductions are gradually uh, higher as we go 2015, 2020 and 2025. And the reason for that is of course that these newer vessels with new standards are uh, representing more and more of the total market. The Marpol uh, environmental control areas started here in the Baltics and the North Sea and the English Channel. Uh, they have stricter regulations than the rest of the world with respect to, to uh, sulfur content of the fuel. Uh, it was not 2011, it was proposed to 2011, but in 2012 the North America, both the East and West Coast, were 
added to this sulfur control areas and a number of other areas of the world has been proposed. The light blue ones, Mediterranean for instance, um, has been proposed as new stricter control areas. This is a graphical illustration of what is already uh, decided upon when it comes to the sulfur content of fuels. And as you can see, something has already happened. We are now somewhere here. You have new stricter regulations in all EU ports. Uh, the world or, or the SECA area regulations is a stepwise approach here, but uh, a new significant step will come in slightly more than a year. Uh, if it's not pushed, there are some uh, initiatives. And then uh, the world is a bit slower to, to reduce the sulfur content. NOx, um, these are uh, the environmental control areas, much more ambitious from 2015. And this is a major concern for short sea shipping in Europe, for instance, now, that this will be very costly to achieve this. Finally, Maersk Shipping has um, produced uh, a document with um, uh, sort of uh, uh, focusing on their environmental footprint and, uh, and how this could be uh, made smaller. Uh, and uh, they are partly based, uh, basing this on new technology, the new vessels that they have. And uh, they also focus on developing efficient logistic solutions. So summing up the, the questions here that we asked in the beginning, which mode is most environmental friendly? It cannot be given in a general way, this, this answer. Uh, maritime may be, definitely for dry and wet bulk vessels. They are clearly superior to land-based modes and, and usually you wouldn't think of using uh, trains or uh, trucks for uh, transporting this over longer distances. Then it's only pipelines which are the alternative. But for container and rover vessel, the situation is more marginal, uh, especially if you compete against electrified railways, but maybe also in some cases versus trucks and diesel trains. A smaller pallet vessel, though, the last case that we have, needs a very, average, a very good average load factor in both directions to compete with the truck. Um, but there is a number of factors that you need to control if you want to do an analysis. And uh, one thing is whether you look at it from a marginal or average perspective. If you have a shipment going from Molde to, to uh, Paris, for instance, and there is already a vessel sailing with empty capacity, of course the marginal contribution of that would be very small uh, with respect to added uh, CO2 emissions. On average, it might be a different story. We need to look at the distance advantages and disadvantages of the modes, of course. Uh, you need to apply realistic round-trip load factors, which I've seen a lot of studies that have much, higher, much too high load factors assumed compared to typical market conditions. And then speed is very much uh, uh, an important factor, especially when it comes to the shipping alternative and then what sizes of vessels are realistic given the volumes of transport that you need. The bigger the vessel you can apply and, uh, and fill, uh, the better the environmental situation for the vessel would be. And then finally, whether we consider emissions or impacts of emissions, and, uh, and that would also normally benefit the shipping side if we consider impacts. So this, the conclusion is then that the answer must be given in a particular context and not as a general uh, one. Um, some of the figures I've presented are some more, uh, somewhat surprising. Uh, and um, this comes from the fact that many policy papers and so on contain uh, figures that are relevant for bulk vessels, not row row container pallet vessels. They may not be based on realistic load factors and typically uh, they contain quite big vessels. Um, 
The technical innovations has been more prominent in the road transport sector, maybe up until now. Things are happening in the shipping business these days, as we have seen with the new regulations. Um, and uh, there is another problem that uh, ships live much longer than trucks. So even if you have stricter standards for new vessels, it takes many years before they become dominant in the market. Whereas if you next year add a Euro 6 truck to the market, this will be the average truck for long distance hauls in Europe in only four or five years. And then again, many analyses focus on what is technical po technically possible rather than what is doable in an actual market. Okay, these are some articles that I've written along with uh, some others and which this is based on. So that's it um, uh, for today. Um, next week, uh, Sven will have a lecture and then we'll have a guest lecturer on uh, INCO terms and different uh, uh, aspects of that uh, in two weeks' time. But please fill in this uh, Hemol the X or the video uh, type thing. It's, the link is in Fronter. Thank you.